Uh, good night of Shabbos, everybody. We begin with Birchas Khanim, Vayadabar Dinayal Mesha Lamar, Dabar Alarm Vabana Vlema Kesavorko, Espana Yisrael, Amurlahem, Yvarecha di no Yvishmerecho, Yoira di Noi Pana Velecho Vihuneko, Yisa di Noi Pana Velecho Vyosim Lacho Shalom, the Somu Shemia Bene Yisrava Niavorachem. I'd like to thank the sponsors for Kiddush this uh, Shabbos. For tomorrow, we're going to be having a Kiddush in a box over at our services. Services will start at 9 o'clock tomorrow. It's supposed to be nice weather, cooler. So we look forward to having all of you uh, join with us if you live in the area for Shabbos services. So Kiddush is sponsored by the Johnson family, and it's also sponsored by the Hetna family. The Hetna family is sponsoring in honor of the six million of our brothers and sisters who fell during the Holocaust. And just like Noah had the responsibility to repopulate the world, we too, the survivors of the Holocaust, have that obligation to repopulate the Jewish world. So thank you very much to both families for sponsoring this week's Kiddush. The, the, the sages look into the, the verse in the Bible that says that Noah built the ark and this ark and this week's portion had within it Noah's family, all the animals, the birds, all the insects. And it tells us that it took Noah a period of 120 years to build the ark. 120 years. One individual spent 120 years constructing an ark. And it seems strange. Although the ark was quite big, it was 600 feet long. It was twice the size of a football field. It was 100 feet wide, 60 feet in its height. But still, 120 years is a long time. So Rashi writes that there are many ways of relief and salvation before God. God could have saved Noah in, in, in countless of ways. So why did he trou trouble Noah with the construction of an ark? He could have simply just caused a miracle for protection of Noah, that the flood wouldn't harm his family. He could have simply just beamed him up to heaven for the period of time. Why does he have to have Noah go ahead and build an ark? And Rashi explains that the building of an ark was in order to arouse the curiosity of those in his generation, that people would see this man building an ark, and therefore they would come to him and say, why are you building this? What type of cruise do you plan on going on? And Noah would say, I'm not going on any pleasure cruise. I'm building this because the Holy One, blessed be He, God Almighty is going to bring a flood upon the world because your behavior is wicked and evil with the hope that they will go about and repent their ways and change their ways so there wouldn't have to be a flood in the first place. Now, Noah could have fulfilled this divine commandment with swiftness, quickly, um, and then having the, the uh, simply just building an ark, even if it took a year or two, would bring about the curiosity of the neighbors. But Noah, it took him 120 years to do it. Why 120 years? So the verse alludes to it by saying that the, construction, the instruction from God was, Asay lecha tevas atzigofer, make for yourself. What does it mean for yourself? It wasn't just for Noah. Noah's wife was there, his children was there, his in-laws were there, his, his, uh, the animals were there, the insects were there. So what does it mean, take for yourself, make for yourself? And the explanation is by a barbanel, that is not just that it's take for yourself, but it's by yourself. Interesting. But in the uh, commandment to Noah to build the ark, it was specifically commanded that Noah needed to build this by himself. And that would explain 120 years to build an ark in back in those days. That would be 100 feet long, would take an individual decades and decades and decades to, to complete. But why? <laughs> It may answer why it took 120 years, but why was the commandment that Noah had to build it by himself? Why not have people help? Why not have other assistants? Why not hire a staff? Why not hire construction workers? After all, Noah was the moral giant of the generation. He was the tzaddik, the righteous person of the generation. He was busy being righteous, right? He was also known as an inventor. The Torah records that he invented many things. He was also a scientist. He was a philosopher. He was a theologian. He was a teacher. He was a prophet. 
He was a man of means. So he's a busy person. As I told you, the Torah opens with the verse, Ish, ish Tzadik Tamim Hoyah He was a righteous Tzadik of his time. He was the Tzadik of his day. So why shouldn't Noah go ahead and hire a hundred staff people under him? He continues doing what Noah did all of his life, and he has these workers. He checks up on it from time to time. And the Lubavitcher Rebbe asks this question, and he suggested that this instruction of God communicating this message to Noah about that it has to be you yourself is a message to all those involved in saving people, in building communities, in saving the world, so to say. You don't delegate this type of work. Work when it comes to community, work when it comes to your fellow has to be done by you yourself. Sometimes the Rebbe says, you can think to yourself, I'm an important person, I'm a leader, I'm a public figure, I'm a scholar, I'm a CEO, I'm a celebrity. My job is to find the funds and get people to do it. Says the Rebbe, no, your job is to actually get involved and do, to take the hammer and take the nail and build the ark. There are certain labor, certain work you don't delegate. You don't delegate the mitzvah of helping another person. You may be the greatest of the great, but when it comes to saving the world or saving one individual, you lift up your pants, you get your feet dirty, and you get to work. You know, I've asked this question in a sermon a few years ago, what's the difference between a surgeon and a pilot? Think about this for a moment. If you're in need of surgery, God forbid, you find out the surgeon and you start asking a million questions about what school did the surgeon go to? How many years of experience does a surgeon have? What's the track record? Do I know anyone that used the surgeon? Can I speak to the people that used the surgeon? What was the surgeon bed manners like? What's the surgeon's rate of success? A hundred calls you make and rightfully so because this is your body, your life, and you're going to make these calls. Your life is in the surgeon's hands. But why is it that when you get onto an airplane and you sit down to fly, you never ask before you got on this plane, who is the pilot? What school did he or she go to? How many years experience does he or she have? What are the rate of mishaps that this pilot, I mean, you're putting your life in the pilot's hands. So why is it that we all clearly will do this when it comes to a surgeon and yet I don't think any of us actually do it when we're going on a plane to ask questions about the pilot. And the answer is obvious. That when it comes to the surgeon, the surgeon will operate on your body and then the surgeon will go home. The surgeon remains intact. He goes back home to his family to relax, to whatever it is that he was doing. The pilot, on the other hand, is flying together with you on the airplane. And so he's exposed to the same exact risk as the passengers. If I'm going down, he's going down. So the surgeon you research well, because the surgeon is going home that night. You wanna make sure you're also going home. Your pilot, you don't have to research as much because you know that if he doesn't know what he's doing, he would never board that airplane. Some leaders are, are like great surgeons. They're brilliant scholars, they're legal experts, they're eloquent, they're fine activists, they're lovely people. And yet their approach is that of a surgeon. They try to help the patient, they help the community to the best of their ability, but ultimately they remain outside or they delegate it to someone else. The true leader is like the pilot. He doesn't only delegate, he's in the trenches, he's with the people, he works hard, he makes sacrifices, and that's what makes all the difference. There's a, a story I would like to share. It's a rather personal story, and many of you have heard it from me before, but it's okay to hear it again. In March of 1939, as Europe stood on the brink of World War II, there was a man by the name of Chiyun Sugihara who was appointed by the Japanese government to open a consulate in Lithuania. Sugiara had barely settled down in his new post when the German army invaded Poland on September the 1st, 1939. 
and a wave of Jewish refugees streamed into Lithuania, bringing along terrifying stories of what they've heard of German atrocities against the Polish Jewish people. Desperate to flee the approaching Nazis, these refugees escaped from Poland with no possessions, no money. And because the, the Germans were rapidly advancing, the only escape was to go further east. But further east was the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union would only allow a Jew to pass through Russia if they had a transit visa. Where are they going from here? You can't stay in our country. And so the Jew needed a visa to get out of Lithuania, to go into the Soviet Union, but they needed a visa where they're going from there. And so obtaining a Japanese visa became a matter of life and death. So one morning in July of 1940, Chiyun Sugihara and his family were awakened by a crowd of a hundred Jewish refugees standing outside the consulate, all desperately hoping for a visa. And facing these women and children and elderly people with pleading eyes made Sugihara feel helpless. He wanted to help, but he had no authority from his government to issue visas. And so he checked with the foreign ministry in Tokyo and he wired his government three times requesting permission to issue these visas. His requests were denied every time. The time was running out for the refugees and Sugihara had a difficult decision to make. He knew he would be fired. He knew he would be disgraced. He knew he would be penalized if he defied government orders. But he also knew that he couldn't allow these people to die. In the quote of Sugihara, I may have to disobey my government, but if I do not, I will be disobeying my God. And Sugihara said to his wife, Yukiko, I know I have to follow my conscience here. And the family, his wife, and his children decided they will support their father's decision. As the Nazis threatened to invade Lithuania, the Jews of that region knew that their fate would hold so, so thousands surrounded now the Japanese consulate, hoping maybe they can convince Chiu and Sugihara to give them a visa. From July 31st to August 28th of 1940, 29 days, Chiyun and Sugihara sat for endless hours, composing visas, writing them by hand, hour after hour, day after day, every visa entirely by hand. He didn't stop to eat. His wife sat by his side and fed him so that he wouldn't stop. At the end of the day, she would have to massage his hands from the pain that he suffered from spending an entire day writing. From the original hundreds of applicants, it turned into thousands. Day and night, desperate people lining up outside the council and begging for a visa. There was a time where people started climbing the compound wall and Chiyun and Sugihara heard what was going on and he stopped and he went outside and he calmed them and he said, you don't have to climb the wall. I will not abandon you. As long as I am here, I will continue to write visas. And so he did, until the Japanese government forced him to close the consulate and leave Lithuania. And even then, as he departed, he continued to write visas on his way to the train station in his car. And after boarding the train, he kept on signing visas so long as the train was still in the station. And he would hand them out the window on the train stop where there were additional Jews waiting hoping to save yet another life. And as the train began pulling away, he took the stamp, the official stamp from the consular office and he tossed it out the window and he told them, use the stamp, forge visas, do what you can to save your life. Sugihara saved 6,000 Jewish refugees. He gave out visas enough he gave out close to 2,000 visas. Some visas were for an entire family, more than one name written on the visa. 6,000 Jews managed to escape, become known as the Sugihara survivors. Chiyun Sugihara was a regular man. He was a simple person. 
He could have delegated it to someone else. He could have told the staff person, hey, see what you can do to help. Yeah, maybe write out a few visas today. That's what most people would do in his position. But like Noah, he was told by his conscience, you, you need to do it. This is not something you can delegate. After receiving the visa, the refugees took the train route all through Moscow and then followed the Trans-Siberian Railroad to Vladivostok and from there the boat onto Kobe, Japan. Most stayed in Kobe, Japan for a few months and then when war broke out and Japan was involved in the war, they moved on to Shanghai, China. And from Shanghai, some spent years there in the shtetl, in the ghetto of Shanghai. And then from there onwards, some to Israel, some to the United States, some to Canada, some to Australia. I want you to know that today we can calculate that there are over 120,000 Jews alive because of this one man. 120,000 survivors from the original 6,000. Now, at the end of the war, the Soviets imprisoned Sugihara and Yukiko and their son in an internment camp in Romania. They were imprisoned there for 18 months. When he returned to Japan in 1947, the Japanese foreign ministry dismissed him from diplomatic service because of what he did, and he was fired. With his career as a diplomat shattered, Sugihara became depressed and withdrawn. Not only had he suffered the indignity of losing his career, but approaching the age of 50 at that time made it hard for him, hard for him to get a job. And Sugihara and his family therefore entered into a life of extreme poverty and hunger. Being a humble and modest man, Sugihara never mentioned his wartime deeds to anyone. And the world knew little of him. Not only that, he himself never knew if a single person survived because of his visa. Most people don't know that about the Sugihara story. That all those years, up until 1968, Sugihara himself had no knowledge that any of these visas worked, that the Soviet Union let them through, that Japan let them in. So it's now 30 years later, it's 1968, and he was located by someone named Joshua Nishri. Joshua Nishri was the economic attache to the Israeli embassy in Tokyo, and he happened to be a Sugihara survivor. And he needed to find who was that man that gave me and 6,000 others a visa of life. And that reunion with Nishri was most significant for Sugihara finally finds out that not just one, not just 10, not just 100, not just 1,000, they all survive. And at that moment, he realizes that he has no regrets, no regrets whatsoever for what he did. And although he suffered tremendously, knowing that your action saved the lives of so many. And I conclude this story with a postscript. A postscript that those of you that have studied with me or part of the shul have heard from me numerous times but it's important to repeat over and over and over again because when it comes to a debt of gratitude, it's never enough. During that period of time on August 15th, 1940, during those 30 days, 29 days, the late Chun Sugihara issued visa number 1778 to a 17 year old yeshiva boy who was separated from the rest of his family, from his brothers, from his sisters, all of whom as he would later discover were murdered by the Nazis in Mahshima. And the one who received visa number 1778 was my father, Mordechai Brisky. And I had the good fortune of getting to know Chiyun Sugihara's son, Hiroki Sugihara. And on one of our occasions that we've met, and we met quite a few times, Hiroki gave me this. I don't know how, if you're going to be able to see it, but he gave me this file of papers. You obviously can't see the text. Well, what this is, is a listing of every visa that his father gave out, every name, visa number, and the date that he issued it. And you go through it, and you go to that visa number, 1778, and you see your father's name there. 
one name, one simple line on a piece of paper. And you realize what that means. This very same file of papers would have looked very similar if I was holding it up, if one name was missing, right? You wouldn't know that one name was left out. It still would have been a very impressive list. No one would notice that one name wasn't there. One visa less. Mr. Stugihara would still be a great hero of our people and of all of humanity. One name less. And I wouldn't be sitting here right now. And my children wouldn't be here. And my brothers and my sisters and all their children and all their grandchildren. One name less on my world would not have been. Each name on this list is more than a name. It's a world. It's a world of life. It's a world of smiles. It's a world of joy. It's a world of laughter that goes on and on and will continue for all eternity because one single man cared enough to issue yet one more visa. God says to Noah, you build the ark. You yourself don't delegate when it comes to saving lives. Don't delegate when it comes to caring for people. Get yourself involved. Like Noah, this angel of a man did not pass the buck. Day and night he sat and used those fingers to save Jews. Because when there's a pending flood, you don't wait to hire people. You pull up your sleeves and you get to work. How many times in our lives are we faced with the opportunity to do good? To help someone. To care. To visit someone to cheer someone up, to do a mitzvah, to reach out and affect the life of another. And too often we take these opportunities lightly because we let someone else do it. I'll make sure someone else does it. Perhaps, perhaps the next time we're asked to extend ourselves for another, we think twice before turning down the opportunity. And we think about this verse in this week's portion, what God says to Noah, you have to build the ark. So let's go out there and let's build some arcs. Have a wonderful Shabbos, everybody. We'll see you all next week.